Well, Lord Jones, thank you very much, uh, Chief Minister. And ladies and gentlemen, it's a great honor to be the first GPEG guest. I'm very, very touched to have been asked. Think tanks are incredibly important, driving debate, planting the flag of ideas a little bit ahead of the vanguard of the politicians, and generating the kind of discussion, the diversity, the variety, the pluralism of opinion that allows good policy decisions to be made. So, so thank you for having me. Uh, thank you to John Moulton for arranging my visit and, and putting me up. Uh, and thank you to all of you, first of all, for supporting GPEG. And second, thank you to all of you. I, I always feel one should say this in places like this. Those of you who are or have been in the private sector and have generated revenue for all of us politicians over the years. I've, I've noticed that, uh, I don't know whether this is the case on the island as well, uh, Chief Minister, but I've noticed that in the UK, politicians are really very good at thanking nurses and teachers and soldiers and policemen, quite rightly. So we should be. But I wish we would occasionally find the time also to thank the people who generate the surplus that pays for the nurses and the teachers and the soldiers and the policemen and us. So on this occasion, if never again, thank you, all of you, in that category. Yeah, uh, uh, Digby was right. I was born in Peru. And if I may, uh, uh, with a little anecdote uh, about Peru, when I, when I was growing up uh, in Lima, it was a city ringed with shanty towns. There were slums rising on the slopes of the hills in all directions. And in my childhood, we'd have friends who'd come and stay from Britain, from Europe, from the US. And they'd do the usual thing. They'd visit Lima, and then they'd go off to do the Inca Trail. They'd go to Cusco and Machu Picchu, and they'd come back. And almost always, almost always, they would ask the same question. They'd say, why is it that people are leaving these pristine Andean villages and coming to live among the traffic fumes and the open sewers of these shanty towns. Now, my friends, that's a very first world question. No Peruvian ever needed to ask why somebody would leave a village where there was no drinking water, no electricity, no clinic, no school, no job. What they understood and what I think we often miss in our uh, aesthetically infused world where we, we dislike uh, the sight of industrialization. What, we, what, we, uh, what they were missing is that people have agency. People in poor countries will act in a rational way. They understood, as we perhaps don't, that these shanty towns, barriadas, they were called, barriadas de Lima, were transitional. Transitional for them as individuals and transitional as places. When I go back now, a lot of them have become just districts uh, suburbs of Lima. I had occasion much later in life to spend a bit of time in one of these barriadas, and I have to tell you, I have, I have seen high unemployment black spots in Europe where there is a greater sense of despair. What people miss about these places is that they're industrious, they're busy, everyone is doing something. They're selling cigarettes at traffic lights, they're sorting through the rubbish uh, uh, to, to sell recycling and so on, and they are driven by the conviction that the best is yet to come, and by and large, they're right. And we should be very wary of an anti-development, anti-capitalist, anti-globalization agenda driven fundamentally by aesthetic distaste. I think it was a great Victorian novelist, Anthony Trollope, who said, poverty, to be scenic, should be rural. And that, it seems to me, is what's pushing a lot of the kind of uh, the homework that we get, that our children get in geography. So, oh, terrible, evil Western companies exploiting poor people. No, people are making rational decisions, and if we want to help them, buy more of their stuff and sell them more of our stuff. But I was, I was digressing because of the Atto Welfare story. Let me, let me begin uh, by asking you a question. Who here can tell me the opening line of the film The Godfather? One of the greatest films. Somebody must remember. Before I fall foul of the island's anti-discrimination laws, I'm going to say that I'm, I suspect I'm mainly looking at the men in the room. It tends to come top in the list of men's films uh, rather more than of women's films. Anyone remember? So, go on. 
no, that, that comes a little bit later, if I remember. No, it, 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 it opens uh, before the camera has come on. You hear the line spoken before the, the, the filming starts. And the line it opens with is, I believe in America. And it is spoken by the undertaker who's come to the Godfather's wedding. And he's done all the right things. He's the, if you like, he represents the rule of law and civilized society. He's an immigrant in a new country. He's done well. He's kept the law. He started a small business. And he now protests his daughter has been assaulted. And he is being denied justice because we are led to believe the uh, assailants have political connections. And he comes to the Godfather, played by Marlon Brando, and says, what are you going to do for me? Now, Marlon Brando represents a very different kind of ethic. Not the law-abiding, tax-paying immigrant, but the, the much older ethic of tribe. Goodies and baddies. My tribe good, your tribe bad. In fact, if you think about it, almost every film is based around that same ethic, right? Think of any of them, Narcos or Game of Thrones or Harry Potter. It is taken as read for purposes of the plot that there are goodies and baddies. We don't explore the motives of the baddies. It's just presented as a, as a datum that that's... Uh, who they are, because they're against us. Anyway, the conversation goes on. The undertaker is asking for justice. Marlon Brando says, you have to be part of my team. He begins to get angrier and angrier with him. Eh? You, you show me no respect. You know, don't, don't even call me Godfather. Uh, you never come and see me, even though my wife and yours have coffee together. And eventually, the penny drops. And the undertaker understands all of the morality that I have been led to, to trust, all of the laws and the taxes and the systems of balanced government are meaningless. I have to be part of this guy's team. And one day, it may be that that day will never come. I may ask you for a favor. It's the older morality, the oldest ethic. My tribe good, your tribe bad. Try making a movie out of the undertaker's business experience rather than out of that tribalism, right? On a very deep caveman level, we respond to stories that feature this tribe. Now, special prize for anyone who can remember the name of the undertaker. It features both in the original novel and in the movie. Now, this is, I'd be impressed if anyone gets this, but this is where you realize uh, that Puzo was a genius. The Undertaker is called Amerigo Buonasera. Good night, America. You go down that route, it's all over, right? Once you allow the essence of a civil society based on the recognition of the unique individuality of each citizen under the law to be replaced by this older ethic of do I like them? Are they part of my team? It's all over. Uh, I mentioned last night to some of you uh, one of my favorite anecdotes about Stanley Baldwin, the interwar prime minister, an anti-intellectual uh, and notionally conservative prime minister who was asked towards the end of his life whether he had been influenced by any theorist or thinker. And rather to the surprise of the interviewer, because Stanley Baldwin didn't read books, rather to the surprise of the interviewer, he said, yes, I was. I was very influenced as a young man by the teachings of Sir Henry Maine, whose lectures led me to understand that all human progress is the story of the move from status to contract. And then he paused frowning and said, or was it the other way around? <laughs> It's a cute story because even the most sublime ideas become worn through use. But I want you just to think for a second about those three words, status to contract. For almost all of human history, our relations one with another were determined by birth, caste, and tradition. 10,000 years have passed since the first of our ancestors dropped a seed in the ground found that plants would grow there and made possible the stationary civilization that brought cities, writing, and monarchies. And also in their wake brought slavery. Without exception, every single one of those early civilizations was a slave-holding society because the essence of it was oppression and caste and serfdom. For almost all of us, every one of us in this room 
is descended from slaves. Every one of us in this room is descended from slave owners, right? It couldn't be otherwise. It was practiced on every continent and in every archipelago. And the breakthrough comes with this extraordinary, sublime idea that we are not determined by the accident of birth, that our future is not laid down because of who our parents happen to be, but that we are all autonomous individuals able to enter into contractual relationships one with another on an issue-by-issue -issue freestanding basis. That is what we mean by the move from status to contract. It sounds so simple when you put it like that, and yet it has made possible the whole of, of the modern world because it allows the idea of free expression, of free debate. It allows the idea of free inquiry. We get away from the idea that everything is laid down and we introduce the notion that truth can be arrived at through experimentation and robust inquiry. None of that comes naturally. None of that is innate. We still think with our cavemen minds. Our genetic code is still on the savannas of Pleistocene Africa. We're still tribal creatures who evolved in kin groups. And so the ideas that made the Enlightenment possible, the idea, for example, that someone we don't like might still have a useful thing to tell us, do not come naturally. I remember when I was about nine years old, uh, my, uh, my parents were with a friend who was unspeakably rude to this young couple who he'd never met before, so much so that my parents left. And afterwards, uh, my father said to this, this rude friend, why were you so bloody to that young couple? You'd never met them before. And he said, oh, I had enough of French Canadians during the war. Now, even age nine, I thought I could spot a fairly serious flaw in my parents' friend's logic. Namely that whatever problem he'd had with French Canadians during the war, it wasn't with these particular two French Canadians, this young couple, uh, who he'd not met before, right? And yet, for almost all of human history, I would have been the outlier. He would have been in the mainstream. And those of you who are looking at it in the way that I did, are products of a very peculiar and unique education system that has detribalized us and has elevated the individual and has taught us the virtue of autonomy. In almost any other culture, the idea of carrying feuds and vendettas would have been absolutely central to the public morality. If you don't believe me, have another look with open eyes at the Old Testament. In almost every book, you see the same thing. Let me give you one peculiarly gory example because it so offends uh, our modern sensibilities. Uh, there's a moment in the reign of King David when there's a famine. And David prays and says, what's gone wrong? What do I need to do? And God tells him, well, this is all because your predecessor, King Saul, wronged, broke a treaty to attack a people called the Gibeonites. And because of his offense, all of the people of Israel are now guilty by association. The word used is blood guilt. Right? So David says, well, what do I need to do? And God says, you have to make restitution to the Gibeonites. So David goes to see them and he says, what can I do to make it up to you? And they say, we want you to give us seven of Saul's grandchildren so that we can execute them. And David complies. The seven grandchildren are executed, and the famine ends. Right? Now, if you're thinking, that's a bit unfair, it wasn't the grandchildren who had done anything wrong, again, I can only say you, like me, are products of an unusual morality inculcated by an unusual education system. Because for most of human history, that would have been the prevalent ethic. My tribe good, your tribe bad, the same thing that made The Godfather a watchable film, the same thing that deep down appeals to us below the layers of our education. You see where I'm going with this. The most important thing is educating people to make modern society possible, to, if you like, inculcate the values that allow us to live 
in an open society, to correct these caveman impulses that will otherwise color our relations. The great uh, German-American uh, philosopher Hannah Arendt, the, the woman who covered the, the Eichmann trial, had a nice phrase in one of her books. She said, every generation, Western civilization is invaded by barbarians. We call them children. And what she meant by that is, you and I come into the world with the same emotional and mental apparatus that our ancestors would have done 5,000 years ago. The reason we don't live in the same brutal world that they did 5,000 years ago is because we've elevated the individual. We've learned a series of values that do not come naturally, that allow us to transcend our tribe, and that make possible a world that has moved from status to contract. The job of acculturating each new generation lies primarily with universities and schools. They have to be the ones that teach the difficult ideas that, yes, you know, uh, so-and-so's grandfather did something, but that wasn't his fault. All these ideas that don't come naturally to us. You see how quickly in the current Ukrainian war people have taken to confiscating the assets of Russians who have broken no law, cancelling Tchaikovsky from uh, concert programs because my tribe good, your tribe bad. We, we uh, revert to it very easily. At the moment, I fear that our educators are not only not doing that, but are doing the opposite. In the name of identity politics, whatever you want to call it, they are teaching that the only important, or at least the most important thing about you is that you happen to be white or female or whatever it is. And that is a reversion to the pre-modern idea of caste. We are going back to this incredibly dangerous and constraining idea that we're defined by accident of birth and physiognomy rather than by what our individual characters represent. It's not for me to comment particularly on the affairs of the bailiwick of Guernsey. But I picked up uh, in the news that there is some debate here about whether to have anti-discrimination laws and so on. Let me just make two general points rather than entering into the detail of the legislation. First, beware of anything that defines people by category. When we see this happening, we always think that our intention is good and that therefore the end justifies the means, but we open the door to an illiberal society in which the collective is elevated above the individual. Let me give you the example of uh, quotas in university admissions, now widespread across North America and beginning to make their entry into the UK. This is not a new idea. In almost every fascist country between the wars, there were quotas, numerous clauses it was called. And the quotas, the justification for them was exactly as now, were supposedly to uh, increase representation for underrepresented groups. Who were the underrepresented groups in the eyes of European fascists? Well, obviously the underrepresented group that they were worried about was non-Jewish people. And so they restricted the number of Jewish undergraduates in the name of leveling up, making it fair for everyone else. And when pushed, they would say, oh, all we're doing is, uh, uh, is giving people opportunities by ending this over-representation. Over-representation, of course, according to the Jewish proportion of the entire population, not of the urban educated population or of the number of people applying to university, or indeed, most pertinently, of the people actually qualifying to get in to university. Now, if you're thinking, oh, but that's a world away from uh, reserving places for underrepresented groups today. How? What's the difference? It's literally the same argument. All you've done is you've changed the names of the groups. And if you can't see that, you're in the matrix. My daughter at the moment is uh, at Somerville College, Oxford. She's reading French. As a condition of being there, she and all of the others were told, you have to do this unconscious bias test. Uh, what would you do in, in the following scenarios and who's to blame? And What's that got to do with a degree in French? 200 years ago, 
as a condition of matriculating at Oxford, well, she wouldn't have been able to go because she was a girl, but as a male candidate wanting to matriculate at Oxford 200 years ago, she would have had to have complied with the Test Act, right? a requirement. This is extraordinary as it seems to, to us at this uh, distance. A requirement of doing a degree then was to abjure the doctrine of transubstantiation. You had to swear an oath saying, I solemnly swear that the, blood, the bread and wine used in the Eucharist is only symbolic and is not the real body and blood of our Lord. What's that got to do with the French degree? Exactly as much or as little as the unconscious bias test. In both cases, we have elevated and sacralized some completely unrelated value and made it the test of everything. In between, there were 200 years of genuine freedom. And if you don't think that we could revert to these pre-modern ideas of caste and tribe, you're not paying attention to human psychology and to human personality. My worry with all of this uh, elevation of, of I I identity politics is not that it's absurd, but that it's actually dangerously alluring. It, it, it comes very easily to people. And that once we go down that road, it's very hard to turn off it. But one final point, if I may. It should be a principle of those of us who are entrusted with a portion of government that legislation should be a last recourse and not a first recourse. It should be something to be used, what is it the prayer book says of marriage? Reverently, discreetly, advisedly, soberly. soberly. It shouldn't be the first thing that you rush into. You need to have an identified problem that could not be solved in any other way. So if you want to have a, I don't know, if you want to make provision for bathrooms for trans people, in most businesses that will happen. People are really good at mediating these situations. Someone comes along and says, I want to use it, you know, you, you're the employer, you have a duty of care, you talk to the other employees, you work something out. That is less likely to happen if the employee comes and says, here are my rights and you will be in breach of them and I will sue you if you don't do the following. Then immediately you're in an antagonistic situation which is much less likely to be resolved. So let me, let me finish with a plea that we understand the difference between saying, I don't like X, which we will all do about some things, and X should be banned. How dangerously and how easily we slide from the one to the other. Now, everyone has their own X. Everyone has things that they dislike and that they therefore think no one else should do. For some people, it might be fox hunting. For some people, it might be smoking weed. Uh, for some people, it might be uh, shooting pistols. For some people, it might be uh, watching pornography or watching tractor pornography. Or, um, or if not watching the whole tractor pornography, just watching the trailer. But whatever it is, the difference between I don't like this and this should be banned contains the entirety of what we mean by a free society. It was that notion of individual freedom that elevated this country above the run of nations, that has ushered in a period of peace and prosperity that our ancestors couldn't have imagined, that has given us a level of material ease that earlier generations would have attributed to gods or wizards. By heaven, we'll miss it when it's gone.